So kia ora everybody, you're tuning in to Dr Burst from Auckland, New Zealand and in this month's episode of the Avondale Pavilion Project we have another special guest with us, Trust Me. Welcome man. G'day. Awesome, thank you so much for joining us and um, painting an awesome pavilion. Uh-huh. So to kind of kick off, what, what is your cultural background and, and where are you from? Uh, I was born in Wellington. Yeah, cultural background, I'm half Chinese. My dad came to New Zealand via Malaysia when he was uh, eight, 17 or 18 um, but my family have, it's hard to track actually the records aren't great but they, they came via southern China into Malaysia and from Malaysia my dad came here met my mum, my mum's uh, four generation Pakeha and yeah so I was born into Wellington and but I've lived in Wellington uh, in Auckland since I was about five years old. What made them migrate to New Zealand? Uh, education was the main reason that my father ended up here. Uh, I think it was pretty common at the time. There's quite a community of um, young uh, Asian or Chinese men from Malaysia that, that ended up in Wellington, actually. And so from Wellington, how did you end up in Auckland? Yeah, I, I've never got a straight answer on that, to be honest. Like All my family are in the Wellington area, uh, or were at the time, quite a large family. Uh, on my mum's side but we headed north and i feel it i feel like it was to get away from the family <laughs> oh to yeah be honest. nice nice yeah 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 so we, we struck out up north here and you know and i've called auckland home since did you study art or anything in auckland that was something kind of really clear to me from primary school and it just was always a focus for me and I ended up studying graphic design when I left high school. Grateful I did. I knew I wouldn't be a graphic designer while studying, but in terms of uh, just practical skills, yeah, I learned heaps. And it was in the analog era, so super um, broad actually, compared to, I guess, if you were to study it these days in the digital um, era, yeah. How did you kind of end up into this trajectory of of creating art in public space? The art I was most interested in through high school and university was art that was made for public space. Like that's that's where the idea of public space is, is the through line of everything that I've kind of been interested in since I got to uh, senior years at high school. Um, and artists who would do that and that that doesn't that is not like graffiti and street art as a point of reference that's um that's from a fine art i guess from contemporary art practice and artists that were doing it that's where i first encountered it and it just made sense to me when i'd finished studying graphic design i did a one-year research fellowship which basically meant i got a studio at the university a materials allowance and uh, a budget to produce an exhibition at the end of the year and in that year I just um, kind of abandoned all of the discipline and and convention of graphic design and just made art in a studio um, and then halfway through that year I started making paintings on paper that I'd paste up in public and that being the first real kind of engagement with public space how did you select the name Trust Me? Was that a name that you were already rocking at, at that point? No, that at the, exactly that same time, that year of doing a research fellowship, which was me just in a studio painting for a year, starting to make um, paintings to paste up on the street. And I had a large painting underway across um, the course of that year. And my friend Rakai came in one time and I was doing something and said, can I do something on your painting? I was like, yeah man, whatever. It's like very bitsy. Yeah, I looked up a little bit later and he had written trust me on it in a certain place and he had put like a the T's that were like religious crucifix like T's like quite elaborate uh, and he had put a halo above one and the E at the end of trust me had like a devil tail that's what he did and I looked at it I was like that's cool because it's sort of like the uh, contrast you know it had this sort of tension in it and um, so I ended up calling the exhibition that I was making Trust Me. And after that, all the work I made just under that name. Yeah, so I guess it comes from him, to be honest. I know that during that period, you, you mentioned you were making a body of work, you're spending a year painting, starting to kind of get your work out there into the public realm. 
I know that you're also part of another crew that that was formed called Cut Collective. Mm. Did that come quite a bit later, or was that mm. a similar period of time? And why was it formed? Uh, it came not too many years later. I think it was probably around 2000 that I was in that studio making that exhibition and starting to play in public space. I just kept going a bit, and then um, at a certain point, I was that was the main thing I was doing was making you know public art in that way and you'd just see other people doing it so anything that didn't uh, fit within a graffiti framework that people were doing on the street was kind of curious because uh, there wasn't a lot of it and um, you'd, you'd you could see that there were some artists doing certain things and they'd, they'd kept doing it and the ones who kept doing it go right I'm bound to bump into this person at some point so about 2003 I managed that's when I met component um, and I'd already met uh, Enforce One at university actually but didn't really know what he was up to he was just a guy that everyone knew I didn't even know what he was doing there I don't even know if he was studying at university <laughs> but he was always around and seemed to be everywhere and everyone knew him like everyone knew Gary and then it seems like a lot of people knew Sparrow as well, um, but I only kind of met them at that time, but I already knew Flocks from some time, like we met when we were teenagers. Eventually met um, Component and realized what he, you know, it's just like putting it together, like, ah, and you're that dude and that's the stuff you've been doing. Oh, Gary, you're that dude and you're that stuff you've been doing. I'd sort of started um, Flocks making stuff alongside me. Um, with Shed Studio and so on and then yeah eventually just ended up meeting with the like the other dudes um, like Enforce One and Component and then just started making art together or at least put in making and putting our art at, in the same places uh, and some years later you know took it to another level and founded a studio and you know, started a business and so on yeah so together as a as a unit or a crew or a collective you guys really took on quite a lot of commercial jobs as well right oh yeah did many of those opportunities exist at that period of time uh it's yeah no it's quite different i feel like yeah we we i think oh, what year 2008 ish seven or eight i think we took a lease and it was weird like we had just been collaborating up until that point out of you know i had my garage uh sparrow had a studio gary it was elsewhere we'd still we'd make we'd work and work together and do stuff together but then we took a commercial lease and set up our own studio which where we could all work from and that changed everything like we had done like one or two jobs for people before that but it was weird as soon as we got the studio we just started getting work i don't know how it works i don't know how that happened but yeah and then we got busy and then we were, that's that was us we were making our living like doing commercial work and the commercial work would subsidize our art projects like that's how we'd pay to do our own you know quite large projects just taking money out of the jobs and creating a fund from my understanding in the early 2000s there was only really two different types of discourse of of public art kind of happening right you kind of briefly mentioned it mm. one being graffiti and then the other kind of being street art mm. you know for the popular you know mainstream kind of term is that the kind of work that you think you and your collective were making or, yeah. or do you not think you were fitting in that no we were we I, you know we 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 ticked all the boxes really because you looked at like graffiti was already well established and it's quite easy to articulate what it is and to some degree um anything else and there were there's some set formats that the work takes and set forms that the work takes and the methods that are used and so on shares the public space with graffiti but quite different like real different ideology i feel um so yeah we i would definitely say like street art does capture what we were doing i've got no issue with that it's accurate yeah and it was distinct to uh to graffiti mm. were you making art full time was that like your your main mm. gig it was like as soon as we set up that studio that is that i think uh, both flocks and were had been full-time artists for some years before that 
um, both doing apparel, interestingly enough, like well, the t-shirt line, or uh, Flox's had a whole clothing line. But yeah, when me and Enforce One joined, I left the job from AUT. I, but I took um, voluntary redundancy, and when we founded that studio, it was perfect because it gave me some cash in my pocket to like see if we could make it work. And yeah, that was us. That we were full time with its employed as full time artists. Um, balance still juggling, you know, like commercial work requires a certain amount of time and energy and the um, way in which you go about it. And balancing that with our own projects that we'd um, prefer to be doing. What do you think was one of the greatest kind of challenges or obstacles in, in kind of being that full time artist? There's so much to juggle. Uh, we had to teach ourselves how to do business. So we not, not, none of us learn. We had to just learn by doing. So it was great because, you know, we're all doing it. So we're just going, ah, it seems that we need a system to manage this. We go, oh, why don't we blah, blah, blah. So you're just creating the solutions as you go. Um, the biggest obstacles, just getting that balance of personal creative fulfillment versus cash flow right. That's the hardest thing, for sure. And ultimately, that's what tripped us up because we weren't investing in the personal creative space enough. So if you think about it as a well, we, we, we um, let the well go dry and then you've got nothing to draw on. So even your commercial work is, you know, it, it gets, well, it becomes quite, you know, affected because you've got nothing to draw on anymore. As, an, as a full-time artist, is there ever a fear of the kind of financial component like oh you know when's that next paycheck coming and and the idea of security for sure that that's it's hard so if you're doing as a full-time artist like there's versions of like are you doing a lot commercial work or are you just doing it off sale of paintings usually it's a mix of both for most people i know commercial work starts to affect your mentality but also like it can have a net like a detrimental effect on what you do because um if you're not investing enough time in your own pure creativity then it kind of just starts to dilute further and further and further however if you're doing all right selling your own work and that you come a little bit reliant on that then you find your decision making process affected as in terms of like i talk about like in, in terms of meeting the market your head automatically tries to meet the market a little bit even without you knowing so suddenly the work that you're making your artworks, your paintings, whatever you're making, kind of start to move towards sort of the space where there's more likelihood of selling it. And I think that's really natural, but a really difficult one to, to, um, to, to manage. So you speak a little bit about this idea of the market and, and, and that having some sort of alignment to your creativity. I, I believe that Cut Collective has in many ways paved the way or you know built the foundations of a lot of what is kind of accepted nowadays at, you know in terms of like commercial work for murals and things um, how do you think Kite Collective has contributed to that? It's, it's really funny because um, when we were doing it there weren't a lot of options for people to go to like there was some pretty well established artists who could um, produce graffiti commissioned graffiti uh, were really good at it and had a you know we were just well versed in that we were offering something different and um, distinct to that but still you know it's all executed in a similar way but quite different and there wasn't there wasn't a lot of competition to be honest and if I think about it now versus then there's so many more people making a, a living or at least making most of a living via commissioned murals and so on now working for private you know private commissions or working for doing commissions for advertising agencies or product launches or events or whatever it may be there's quite a bit of that work and there's a lot more people doing it and that's great and I feel it's funny because you know um, Cut Collective was just at the right time and place we there was nothing special about us other than our ethic I really don't can't, you can't fault our work ethic like we we're prepared to work as hard as it as, as needed to make it happen um, but yeah, I, it's interesting because I think about um, the other the other component of this is the festivals, and for me in particular with Graffiato, I don't know, we might get into this a bit later, but it's been like a professional development 
kind of project where people are getting uh, platformed and experienced painting walls at a larger scale and uh, getting more visibility and so on. And I think they've been, all of the festivals have been really powerful in regards to you know, helping other artists sort of get viability. It's that idea of platforming. Yeah. 100 percent it's that's what those things are and why that's they're, they're valuable yeah. uh, it platforms artists and the art form and the potential like people can see the transformational effect of a wall with a mural on it and go shit that could be applied wherever like that would be cool over here i've got it you know so suddenly they're turned on and thinking about it and there's a ton of artists who they can easily identify now as well in terms of who they might like to commission because you know well festival suggests a budget and the budget suggests or indicates a funder that's an investment investment. so people are investing in it and it does it legitimizes the art form awesome so turning a little bit to your art practice could you describe to me what your kind of aesthetic of work is i feel like i've been quite stop start for the last six or six to eight years after having like real momentum and a really decent um you know 10 year period of making work quite at quite a prolific level i've had like a six to eight year period where my work focus shifted to be much more um management essentially all art related still full-time working in the arts but not so much practical so i feel like i've got um in terms of my aesthetic and style it it kind of lost its way a little bit prior to that work uh, that all that managerial work and so on it was um i don't even know how to describe it thematically i guess thematically i can think about it like i'm attracted to the idea of nostalgia and things that kind of hark back to something but they don't have to be like long long time ago it might just be like 10 years ago or mm, references to uh, popular culture it's sort of a, it's, it's about invoking a feeling i've always been jealous of the way that music has such a emotive effect um and seems to have uh, an advantage i've always thought that music has an advantage over visual arts in that regard so that's sort of something i always try to kind of look at as a comparison and say ah but what does visual art look like or how would it look like if it was trying to achieve some of the things emotive outcomes that music can do and so i don't know what genre of music my art would be if you extend the analogy yeah these days like i'm back making art with a bit more focus than i have for a long time typography or text rather and typography are probably one of the most enduring elements of my work across the last 20 years because it's again from the music kind of analogy communication so phrases or word combinations and what they can communicate leaving things ambiguous but with enough to suggest a certain thing been really interested in that and that's always been there right now i've just started abstracting the typography so heavily that there's no trace of word or phrase present anymore and so it's yeah it's it's become abstract whereas i was at times really literal um these days it's it's not literal at all you create a lot of work that is relatively site specific at least in terms of the context of the work Um, could you tell us a little bit about why why that is important to you for me it's been it's it's a part of working in public my first encounter with the idea of art in public wasn't graffiti it was like i said art sort of from a fine art perspective that i sort of learned about at school and at um, university while you're choosing or maybe you're choosing you're choosing or someone's choosing or something's dictating where that work goes Um, And if you can, I just think it makes sense to respond to that. So, and this is having the luxury though. So this is where murals and commission murals have an advantage because if you're doing something illegal or without permission, that's not a luxury because you're dealing with time and legality and so on and so on. If you've been commissioned to do a mural, you have the luxury of time and therefore you should give it due consideration. Where is this geographically? What's the relevance of the site? socially um politically um culturally all of these things um what's the yes history of the site like all sites are loaded with the history there's so much interesting stuff 
as an artist as to, 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 to work with and then when you then what I really enjoy about it is you, you, you basically engage in some research and you come up with some stuff and you go well, what's interesting about this stuff like where is the interesting part of this and often you get a sense of that and then you go well, and what about now like apply a contemporary modern filter to it like how is that relevant to now or how is that relevant going forward because I really don't like murals that just are historical tributes and nothing more like okay cool but that's that's acknowledging what's gone before great but can we also try and tie it up with relevancy for now and going forward from here it's such a fertile always such a fertile way to kind of work through ideas um, for murals when you talk about history and and creating you know in some cases site-specific work does your work ever feature any of your kind of cultural history mm. Mm, good or, or is it or is it a kind of essentially a western you know somewhat a western narrative interestingly like when i was making a lot of street art it was kind of all passing through a personal filter about me without really ever going through a personal cultural filter however um, these days i think about myself as being more a vessel I don't necessarily see myself in the in the work that I do these days or the large public mural commissions and stuff. I don't necessarily know that it's important for me to be in that rather than, like I said, I'm just a tool which is bringing together all of the site-specific background history and so on and applying a, a, a contemporary filter to it to try and make it engaging and meaningful for the people who live and work and play in the place where the artwork's going. So, but my, in my own practice, like art making practice, I mean, yeah, it wasn't until two, three years ago that I started even feeling like I was equipped to address ideas of cultural identity through my work. Because it was just a real unknown, I ended up in 2018 living in Malaysia for three months at doing a residency and in the same city where my dad's family is from where his family are from I used to go there as a kid relatively frequently but I'd never had a professional uh, or adult relationship with the place and this so I did I managed to sort of get this so in that time yeah I felt like I was starting to equip myself to actually explore culture my personal cultural identity and I came back from that trip and started um, making work and have made work but it almost sits like alongside what I would do on a normal day it's like its own little project that um, so it's not integrated into my practice in any way it's still it's sort of like a parallel practice to, to what I'd normally do that I might dip in and out of and I feel like I just feel like I don't like yeah it comes from not feeling like I have the uh, familiarity with it enough like I'm not at that place yet it's 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 a it's a time thing I think yeah it's it's an interesting thing to think that you don't um, have personal authority to explore your own cultural identity mm -hmm. but that that is essentially the issue at play there and and could you explain to me a little bit about your kind of create creative process for making work what does that kind of typically look like I mean, of course, there's so many different contexts, right? And yeah. Each one may be different, yeah. but... But it all starts in a book, in a sketchbook. Like, I just cannot... Everyone around me is um, in Procreate. I look at it and I love it, but I don't do it. I still just have sketchbooks. So I just... That's 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 me. It's, the, it's that black book thing. I don't, you know, I don't draw pieces in my... Well, I do, but um, <laughs> not, it's not the purpose of these things. It's, uh, yeah, I... Creative process is finding the thing that's interesting about what you're doing. Because typically, like if it's a commissioned mural, for instance, it's like it's that thing. It's like, where is this going? What's interesting about this place? Its history, its people. What is it about the the relationship of, or what is the nature of the relationship between people and place in this particular area? There's always something that stands out when you start looking at that. So I, I just start there and making notes as I go, themes emerge or words emerge or ideas emerge out of that that then you just have to try and give visual shape to. So 
it's identifying those themes first and then trying to figure out how are we gonna what's that gonna look like and then you have to like once you've identified your content because that's your that's your content your visual content once you've got some visual content then it's just the matter of like resolving i feel like it's just a, a yeah a process of um problem solving visual problem solving you're trying to address composition and scale and color and um, all of these things meanwhile trying to get it to a place where it feels right and by right i mean it feels like it addresses those themes that identify early on um in a in a in a good way mm. and by that stage yeah I, I work right up to producing a really detailed visual and if it's uh, a mural then i have the mural in front of me and it's just a matter of reproducing it as accurately on the wall as possible do you think that you are an artist or a designer or is it a hybrid of both i feel it's a hybrid of both i can't yeah I, I don't necessarily want to make the distinction but i do make the distinction and it is it's it's between those two things or it draws on both i can't uh shit yeah like my graphic design training i can't not draw on that like it's that's uh, that will always be part of how i i work um and but then you know i did a master's in art basically so i did a part-time so i had five years working in a space that was just about art not about design um working in a fine art context so i i know and there's man there's great things about both approaches and it's seems it seems odd that you don't encounter a blended approach more often but how having said that the place where I do encounter it the most is with people who are engaged in making public art, mm. funnily enough, who have come from graffiti or street art backgrounds. Yeah. And, and so with this particular pavilion that you recently painted, could you explain to us what the concept behind that was? Mm. I mean, kind of like what I've outlined, it's like, where is this thing going? Okay, so it's uh, in Avondale. It's on an empty lot. Um, this empty lot is, from what I've always known, it has is been is called Three Guys. So it's like, ah, oh, you paint, at, go paint at Three Guys. Three Guys being an old supermarket. So it's an empty lot because they knocked a supermarket down and never did anything with it. And this is where the, you know, these walls are that in Avondale that people go to paint. And so the pavilion sits on this lot. It sits on the three guys site so it's like okay three guys cool the pavilion itself is such an interesting structure to have to paint so many facets so many sides big three you know three-dimensional thing um, which i haven't actually never dealt with before but i realized when i was looking at it that there's three main viewing angles um, and so I was like, all right, so three angles to view this thing from more, but like I was saying from three angles, I can cover it 360 degrees. I can see every part of it. If I stand in one of three positions around it. So, um, I created three images, uh, which are basically abstraction, three abstracted images of the letters G U Y S or GU, no, just GUI, so Guy. So it's three compositions of Guy, three guys. And um, I projected uh, onto that pavilion from the three different viewing angles and then uh, drew my lines down and then came back and painted it. So there's three paintings on that pavilion structure. Each one of them says Guy. Oh, that's awesome, man. And the results are pretty, pretty incredible. I think the way that the colors kind of transition, particularly when when I did the stop motion video, it's nice to see it kind of evolving when you're going 360. Yeah, yeah, that and that was and that was an unexpected. I wasn't sure how like what would happen when these three different artworks meet because they don't just meet on neatly on a corner. They kind of overlap and blend. Yeah. Also, a little bit about your practice. Um, I've seen over the past couple of years that you've been collaborating with Flocks. Mm. Um, how did those kind of how did that collaboration come about? and what is that process like for collaborating with someone um well obviously i've worked with flops for a long time 
working going back to Cut Collective. But there's, there was a definite window where we weren't working together, uh, Cut Collective or myself and Phlox. And in, um, it was around 2018, um, she needed some help with, uh, in particular, large scale projects. So she basically, she, she's a maniac who just works non-stop, like non-stop. And I think she was having some issues with like, well, you can't just work non-stop forever your body your whole system would be like hey 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 no no so she was i think that that was at play and so she wasn't able to work at her normal capacity and so she reached out to me to say hey i've got some large scale projects coming up there's some stuff i'd want to like try and figure out with them and i'm keen to see if you want to come on board and help me with these so we started uh it started there yeah just looking at large scale mural collaborating on large scale murals which has been really good i mean we work together so naturally because we've got that history of of working together and we're similar in approach stylistically we're quite different but in terms of approach quite similar um, so it's a very easy one and you know i've collaborated with so many people over the years it's one of the main things i enjoy about working in the in art is um and not you know and not just working along with someone on one thing like but going quite deep on the collaboration um it's hard but it's very rewarding are there, are there egos at play when when you're collaborating with someone else because one person might have an idea of you know the aesthetic or meaning or whatever and then how is yeah. that kind of negotiated ah there's definitely egos at play and um uh, opponent used to always talk about it like leave it at the door when you walk into a collaborative project or you know cut collective was a every day year after year collaborative project and um, essential to leave your ego at the door it's hard though it's, an, it's impossible to separate it entirely but you kind of adopt roles that's sort of what we found so oh okay like you're quite good at this and your artwork is quite um, successful when it's used in this way okay well noted other people's artwork sort of has a different role and a and works in a different way so it's really about understanding that as much as it's about understanding the person yeah and once once you've got got that and um and are able to to keep that all in mind it seems to work quite um smoothly but it is like yeah um, but people and people don't always want to play the same role and they need to be allowed to change mm. but um, it's not easy there's nothing easy about it but it is rewarding so in, in terms of talking a little bit about maybe some projects are in, that you're involved with mm. um, I know that you are heavily invested in the kind of K Road community um, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved in that off the bat that's where we set up Cut Collective Studio um, on Point and Terrace behind K Road. Um, and I'd be always enjoyed K Road before then. And Alleluia in the arcade was my favourite place to, to eat, breakfast, and so on, um, and, and have a coffee. But it changed a lot once we were there on a daily basis with our studio. And, um, uh, you know, eventually I became. A member of the K Road Business Association, and eventually I became the president of the business association, <clears throat> and that led to being stand-in general manager for the um, business association when a uh, general manager left, and we had to appoint a new one. Um, so yeah, I got I got quite deep into it for sure. Like beyond just community of like it's a it's a place which like-minded people attracted to because you there's just a permissiveness about you can be who you want to be you just it doesn't matter who you are as long as that you're okay with other people being who they are and then it all works out well it's, it's you know it's got a creative um, tr tradition up there or a tradition of, of creativity and uh, art and artists and it feels quite natural but yeah um, I definitely have seen it from an another point of view having been um, involved with the business association as i have been it's a hard play it's a hard thing it's as you're trying to manage the unmanageable up there the reason it's 
is what it is and works so well is because it is unmanaged you know what i mean it's it's self-manifested and as soon as you start trying to manage it even if you're trying to do it in its own best interest to try and protect the nature of what's up there then you're kind of self-defeating it's yeah it's kind of self-defeating in your time as an artist or you know a member of the community there uh, you also helped to coordinate an event called Alfresco. Could you tell us a little bit about the motivation for mm. for curating that project? Yeah, well, Fresco was uh, it's a mural festival. Now it's kind of now I refer to it as a program of work because it doesn't just deliver uh, murals on a weekend or on a week. It's just as you can, so it's an ongoing program. But Alfresco was started as a response to um, Auckland Council removing. Oh, it's the 2011 buff, basically the citywide buff that was initiated by the Rugby World Cup. It's when they um, just went so hard across the city and removed so much stuff. And in the K Road precinct, there was, had always been a level of both illegal um, and well, mostly illegal actually, or kind of, you know, gray area um, walls. And like, man, it used to be, it used to look quite different, obviously. When you look at the photos quite heavily tagged a lot of street art a lot of murals um, and then it all got cleaned up so all fresco was created to address that and bring the visual manifestation of community voice back into the precinct and it's a shame to me i feel it's a shame that like the only expression in that um, kind of field is through commissioned murals now but that's just where we're at um, and better that than nothing so well, Fresco is probably uh, I'd say 30 to 30, 30 to 40 murals it's delivered into the precinct um, since it started, which isn't a lot, but it's been on hiatus for a while. But um, yeah, it's 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 useful to have um, because you know without it we wouldn't have a lot of the kind of I guess signature murals that are in the precinct. How resistant do you think, say, the council is to to events like this these days? It's an interesting one, eh? Like, because having worked with council a bit in a number of different capacities, it's such a beast of an organisation, and it's like a multi-headed beast, and um, the heads don't know what each other's doing. You know, it's a very siloed place. So, you, if you talk about um, interest for like street art or murals or whatever it depends which head you're talking to of that beast so lots of different departments have different positions i know that for instance uh, within public art because there's a public art un public art unit at council there's zero appetite to engage in murals that's totally cool they don't have to um, but then within a uh, say community empowerment another part of council they they realize it's quite an effective means of engaging with communities so there's differing appetites for it depending on who you're talking to within council yeah i i just think like uh, it's a super cost effective way um and of creating a sense of identity in in a place so it's a place making tool you know it's part of a the toolkit of place making and um, a really cost-effective one at that. Absolutely, man. And and I know that beyond K Road, you've also been involved in doing stuff in Topol. And one notable event there has been Graffiato. Mm. Could you tell us your involvement with that and kind of how long that's been going for? Yeah, and... yeah Graffiato is a, a mural festival, and it started in 2011. Um, and I just answered an ad. Uh, and the big idea I think and um, they were looking for someone to curate this festival and I was like I, I reckon I could do that because I'd started kind of focusing on that kind of work within Cut Collective um, so when we were doing large projects within Cut Collective large, our own large art projects I was often working in that coordination role um, and so this was just like ah this is I've done this, I know what this is, I know who the artists are that would want to take part in an event like this. Kylie Hawker Green, who started the event, had basically been to Melbourne, seen the laneways and gone, we've got laneways in Topol. 
we got lots of laneways why can't this be here and that's what yeah and so she came back and started working on it putting it together and and raised some money and uh, yeah i applied for the job got the job and in 2011 we did the first graffiato with um mm, i remember about 20 artists or so yeah and it was um pretty loose <laughs> Do you recall how many murals have been created during the course of this event? Yeah, so last year was the 10th year of it, Graffiato, and so I got into the detail with it and I was looking into this and the closest I can um, say is that we've made uh, over 140 murals um, in that time in the Taupo area. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible, man. Yeah. What a, what a contribution to that city. Yeah, and the idea or the aim becoming over the, the years, trying to achieve the, the largest survey or the widest survey of New Zealand artists who practice mural painting in one place. So Taupo is, and I, I believe it is, like the widest survey of New Zealand mural painters in any city in the country because um, we've had about 70, I think about 78 different artists have produced murals um, over that 10 years. Is it is it a project that's still ongoing? Yeah. Because I know, I know yeah. that you had kind of like stepped away from it, right? I have, I, I retired. Uh, 10 years is probably too long for one person to do that job, to be honest, um, and I finally left it and passed it on to um, someone else. And yeah, so it's still going, I, there's no intention of it stopping. Um, it took a few years for the um, for the value of it to be understood. I think we were in the first year we were like weary. We were thinking about letters to the editor that would be appearing in the local newspaper, um, and we're thinking of you know like what's our what's our com strategy for when people are telling us they hate it. Um, but it never really happened. But it did feel like there was indifference though for i don't know a good three years four years maybe and then um the cumulative effect of the more murals more murals more murals and they could see that people were like actually coming purposefully to look at murals so suddenly you know um it became a thing it's yeah a, a... it's destination marketing shit okay now we've got this asset and so yeah it, it, it changed so they there's a definitely an appreciation of the value of it now yeah the council is it's it's funded it's delivered by the local um, business improvement district which is a bid which is exactly the same thing that the k-road business association is so it's delivered by that um, organization that um, is uh, given the money or the budget via council awesome and and one one third project that i really want to talk about is your involvement with a kind of video series or documentary called if these walls could talk yeah. could it you tell me so long ago now yeah what what year was that 2014 i think and what was the motivation for doing that oh man it's one of those things where i'd worked on I've worked on four seasons of an arts TV show called The Gravy and it was an amazing experience for me. So I basically got to travel around um, the country meeting artists and talking to them about what they do. And most of the artists featured are like well off the radar. You know, they're not, they're not um, what you'd call well known or successful in terms of uh, uh, when you think about artists and artists represented in dealer galleries and and institutions and so on um, they were just people making cool stuff and um, that was what that's one of the most enjoyable things I've done and uh, there was a fund in New Zealand on a digital media fund that I, I saw was looking for um, submissions and I, I put in a submission and I talked it up and Basically, I wanted to do what I'd been doing with that when I was working on the other TV shows. Like, I just want to go talk to a number of artists about what they do because I think what they do is really interesting and there's a story to be told about it and I think it'd be interesting for other people. So I wrote up this application and um, got it got accepted, which freaked me out a bit because now I'm suddenly having to make a, a web series. And I know how to do it, but I've never done it. Like, you know, I, I know what's required. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of work and really grateful that I had the opportunity and ended up making five, you know, five stories about five artists 
um, from New Zealand who, whose work I thought and who I thought were really interesting. And if I could, like, you could make 50 of those, easy. And that was back then, you could make more now. Um, everyone's story is interesting, I find. Like, there's always something um, unique and interesting about it. And that might just be me being a geek about stuff, but ah, I know plenty of people who also find it interesting. Would there ever be an appetite for you to go down that road again? I'd love someone to do it. <laughs> I don't know if it's for me to do. Like, because I, I was working as a producer and director and whatever, and I, I um, hired camera operators uh, and soundies and I base and an editor, and um, I put everything else together. And it's a massive workload. I'm not afraid of work, but. Um, at right now at the moment I am weary of things that take me away from doing practical art. That's probably a good segue into where you are now as an artist. So what are three key things that you've learned in your journey? Perseverance is like probably the top because that was one of the things that I've always admired the most about other artists especially going around the country and meeting and talking to artists, you know, there'd be some in their 60s or in their 50s or whatever. They've just been doing that and they've never stopped doing that and they've never had um, a, a big profile, they've never had a lot of financial success, but they've never stopped. So perseverance is it. Like, there is, that's just what you have to do. It's a compulsion, that's, and that's something that I like, that when people talk about this stuff, it, it comes down to a compulsion. If you have that compulsion, then you just have to accept it. Um, which doesn't mean it's easy, it's actually really hard. Um, because all around you, you're being, I don't know, there's just so much telling you to not do it. Because it is hard, but it, mm. yeah, perseverance, that's it. That's basically all it is. <laughs> As an artist, you're making work, but also we we know that you've been pulled into these different areas as well like have to put on different hats and do different things like you said the coordination and maybe one day you're a, a, a producer for a series and then you're doing this and then you're doing that and doing commercial work and how do you I guess um, navigate that kind of workload? I try to hold as little as possible in my head it's the only way I've figured out how to do it is to just develop systems in which the information that I need is on hand I can always find it and that means being organized in terms of archiving emails or job folders so like uh, in a whiteboard and having kind of different categories in which my work the different forms of my work so there's different headspaces that I have to switch from frequently Okay, I can do that if I don't hold any of it in my head. And if, because I also, I just can't function if I try and hold it in my head. It's too overwhelming. My anxiety gets too high. So basically, I say, I don't have to remember anything because it's all written down somewhere. So a lot of energy and time goes into organizing the info, writing it down, putting it in its right place. So I've got, oh, what's going on with that thing? I can go look and find it. I don't have to remember. Uh, yeah, that's that's critical for me. So, what's pulling you to to focus on the kind of practical art aspect at the moment? I don't know. I feel like it's cyclic. I do. I feel I feel like I have this a pull. It's pull's a good word. I'm pulled in different directions. I get immense fulfillment and satisfaction about from work where I'm helping other people do stuff. So if that's project management or festival director or um, exhibition producer whatever it is like I find that so fulfilling but at the same time I get like I have to make my own stuff and at times like that's the cycle it cycles between those two things and it seems to be I mean there's a pattern emerging of about six or seven years I cycle between these two things and right now there's a hard pull to be in a place where I'm making my own artwork and I just go with it. I'm just going with it. And um, the more attractive making my art becomes, the less attractive getting tied up with, um, you know, managing projects becomes. And I'm sure in six or so years' time, it'll go back the other way. Mm. And I'll be over making art and I'll be wanting to, like, 
put on different projects. That's awesome, man. And so what upcoming projects do you have in the pipeline? So, yeah, all fresco we talked about. I've got to deliver some more murals into the K Road area um, over the next few months. Car Collective are actually putting on an exhibition for the first time in nearly 10 years. Yeah, weird how that came together. So we're having a group exhibition in a month's time in September. And then there's the odd, there's always the odd commercial job, which is a mural for a client. Um, and yeah, but otherwise that's it. And that's simple. That's so simple for me to manage because in the past, yeah, I've counted up to 25 projects that are all happening simultaneously. And right now there might be five. So life is, life is good, it's simple. All right, man. So we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, trust me, for joining us in this month's episode of the Avondale Pavilion Project. Uh, make sure you stay tuned because the project is being extended and we do have another six artists joining us over the course of this year uh, to round off 2021. So if you like the content, make sure you like, subscribe and leave us a comment below and we hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers.